Welcome to our uh, online service today. I want to say Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. And uh, if your dad is still with you, I hope you have an opportunity to either talk to him today or go and see him today. And I hope uh, you have a wonderful day. Uh, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 26 today. And it's hard to believe uh, we began this journey, man, several months ago. And uh, two more Sundays, and I think we'll be done with the book of Acts. So. Uh, it's been a great journey for me. It's certainly been a challenge uh, for me uh, as I've read the book of Acts and studied the book of Acts and preached through the book of Acts, and I hope it's been a challenge and a blessing to you as well. One of my friends said that when you start preaching on the book of Acts, you're going to upset status quo. And I said, well, that's what I hope will happen, that God would upset status quo in my life and uh, hopefully status quo in all of our lives to help us to be the, the, the church and the Christians that God want us to, wants us to be. So in Acts chapter 26, uh, the Apostle Paul has an opportunity to once again, and I believe this is for the third time now in the book of Acts, to uh, share his testimony, to share what happened to him on the Damascus Road. And uh, we've already looked at that uh, on a pretty... Uh, in detail on a, in a different message in one of the previous chapters that uh, he shared his testimony. So we're not going to take the time to look at what he has to say to Agrippa in complete detail because, like I said, we've already done that. But I do want to take note of a portion of his testimony here in Acts chapter 26. And uh, we will begin our reading in verse number 16. So if you have your Bibles, Acts 26, verse number 16 and, uh, well, let's back up to verse 15. And this is uh, after the Lord had appeared to Paul on the Damascus Road. And he said, uh, and then Paul says, And I said, who, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things which you have seen me uh, which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles whom I am sending you, notice, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. In this short passage of Scripture, when uh, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks to Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road, he, he really is giving Saul his mission. He's giving Saul his marching orders, and he's letting Saul know what it is that he wants Saul to do. And, uh, and, and so this, uh, this morning we're going to be looking at the subject called for a purpose called for a purpose. And uh, you may ask yourself, well, I understand call, the Apostle Paul was called for this purpose, but what does that have to do with me? Well, I believe we too also as believers, as Christians, are called for a purpose. I believe that God has something for all of us to do, and I think it's very similar to what the Apostle Paul did in some ways as we look at these verses together. The first thing that I notice in verse 16 uh, uh, that, that, that the Lord Jesus says to Saul, he says, I have appeared to you for this purpose. Here's the purpose, Saul, or as we know it better as Paul. Uh, here's the purpose. I'm appointing you as a servant and as a witness uh, to the things which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. And so... The first part of Paul's calling is a call to serve. He has been called to serve. The Greek word serve can imply several different things. Now, there's actually more than one Greek word for the word serve. Uh, one of the words that we're pretty familiar with is the word doulos, uh, which you often see as Paul is writing his letters to different churches he will say that he's a servant of the Lord. And he uses there typically the word doulos, which kind of carries with it the idea of a bond slave. In other words, Paul has bound himself to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's, he's a willing servant. And we've all been called 
to be that kind of servant, to be that doulos, if you will. But the word here is not the word doulos. It's a different Greek word, and uh, it can imply the idea of a minister, not a minister like you think of as a, as a pastor, but someone who ministers or an attendant or an assistant or an officer. And so God has given Paul this mission. He's given Paul the mission to be a servant, to be a minister, to be an attendant, to be a, an assistant, to be an officer in the Lord's army. He was going to use Paul as one of his human instruments uh, to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And so he's going to uh, be one of God's officers, if you will, one of God's ministers, if you will, uh, in the army of the Lord to march against the kingdom of darkness. Well, you and I have also been called to serve. You and I have uh, been given a mission. We are ministers. The Bible tells us that we are ministers of reconciliation. Uh, we're called to take the good news. And if we live in a world, if we've ever lived in a world uh, that needs uh, the, the message of reconciliation, it is the world in which we live today. And I don't, ever, I don't believe there will ever be ethnic reconciliation the way that there needs to be until there is, first of all, spiritual reconciliation between man and God so that man can be reconciled to man. And uh, as that person is reconciled to God and then they're taught from Scripture uh, how we are to uh, interact with other uh, human beings, then we can have the kind of reconciliation that our world is talking about and, and needs. And so being a follower of Jesus does not mean that we just sign a commitment card and we just live our lives for ourselves until we wake up in heaven. No, we've been called to serve. We've been called to take up our cross and follow Jesus. We've been called to live our lives for Him and His purpose and His glory. And so we're on a mission with God and we are His servants. We are His ministers, if you will. And as that servant, we need to be reminded that that is to take top priority in our lives. Uh, the Apostle Paul warned Timothy, he said, Timothy, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuit since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Well, you and I have been, if you're a Christian today, you have been enlisted into the army of God. You have been enlisted into uh, the, the battle, if you will. And uh, God's called you to be His servant. And so we can't get entangled. We can't get distracted. We can't get uh, 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 bogged down with the temporary things of this world. But we have to be focused on the mission and the, and the service that God has called us to. And if we're not careful, we will get entangled uh, and, and we will be hindered from pleasing the one who has called us to be a soldier. We must be on guard against those entanglements and focus on who God's called us to be and serving the way God's called us to serve. And so we're called to serve Him uh, in His purposes and His agenda, not ours, uh, so that we're not entangled by lesser things. And so uh, let me also say, guys, on this Father's Day, uh, you're going to have a lot of distractions in your life as a dad and uh, uh, possibly as a husband uh, that, that's wanting to entangle you, uh, to keep you from being the man that God wants you to be. And let me just encourage you this morning uh, that you've been enlisted by God, if you're a dad, uh, you've been entrusted with one of the most valuable gifts that God has ever given to a human being, and that is the care and, 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 the, uh, and the responsibility to raise and instruct and direct and train and teach another human being. And don't get entangled uh, by all these other things that would hinder you from being the man of God that you need to be for your family, for your children, uh, and for uh, your wife. And so we're called to be servants, but we're also called, secondly, to be a witness. He says in this same verse, he says, Paul, I'm appointing you to be a servant and a witness to these things. Uh, a witness uh, comes from the Greek word that we get our word for martyr from. Uh, when you think about a martyr, 
You typically think about someone who has died or someone who suffers for their faith. But the word there literally means uh, uh, the idea of a person who gives public testimony to his faith before a tribunal and suffers the penalty. Well, God's called us to be witnesses, eyewitnesses uh, of what Jesus has done for us and the change that he's made in our life. And we're to share that message uh, of Jesus and the gospel with the world in which we live. And oftentimes it, it comes with a price. And so he's, he's telling Paul, he said, I want you to be a witness. And he gave all of his disciples that same calling. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 28, he, he tells them in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, for instance, we're commanded to go and preach the gospel to every creature. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we're told to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to do what? And to be his witnesses to all of these places and to the uttermost part of the earth. The, the same passage of Scripture that tells us that we're a new creation in Christ Jesus is also the same passage that tells us that we're a minister or we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, and so we're ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador for the United States uh, goes to the United Nations or goes to another country and they represent the interest of uh, the United States uh, to that nation or to that entity. Well, we as ambassadors of Christ have been called to represent the Lord Jesus to a lost and dying and needy world. We've not been called to proclaim our agendas or uh, talk about our organizations necessarily, those, though that's not always a bad thing, but it never takes precedence over the gospel, over sharing the good news, because that is what's going to change people's lives. Charles Spurgeon said it very uh, pointedly when he said, Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. We're called to be his witnesses. And again, dads, let me remind you, that starts at home. That starts with your children. That starts with your family. Is that as you raise those children, Scripture tells you to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so how tragic it would be to be a witness to everyone else and everywhere else but neglect to point our own children to Jesus. And we understand that they still have a free will and they can choose to reject Him, but we have a responsibility to take the gospel to our family. The third part of Paul's calling is a call to help people see. Now, Paul was not an ophthalmologist or an eye doctor or um, you know, a, a person that uh, uh, helps people wear glasses. That's not what the Lord's talking about. Look at verse 18. He says, To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, and they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. One of Paul's responsibilities was to help open people's eyes, to help people see the truth. Why would he need to open their eyes? Well, we understand that man is born dead in trespasses and in sin. And as a result of that, no one seeks after God. But God is seeking after them. And this is the reason that he's sending the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles, because Satan was blinding their eyes, the Bible tells us, that he blinds the eyes of those who do not believe. So you have, you have our sin nature working against, against us, the fact that we're spiritually dead working against us, and then the enemy of our soul, Satan himself, working against us. And so God uses his mouthpieces, God uses his witnesses, God uses his servants to go and help open people's eyes. Uh, and so there's this battle going on in the minds and hearts of unbelievers. Satan seeking to keep them blind so they won't see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And the Lord Jesus is sending Paul to open their eyes. And you know what? We've been given that same mission. 
Our mission is to seek to open the eyes of those who are blinded by their sin and the devil so that they might see Christ clearly. And the Holy Spirit is working in their hearts and lives inwardly, and He uses us to work outwardly and to share that message. A sinful, depraved, spiritually dead human will not call on God until God first draws them. And oftentimes, other than His Spirit, we know that He uses His Word, but He also uses you and He also uses me. It's kind of like uh, us picking up our phone to try to call the President of the United States. I doubt anybody watching this video today has uh, the President's personal number. You probably didn't have the previous President's personal number, and you probably won't have the next President's personal number. Most of us just don't have that capability. We can't just pick up the phone and call him anytime we want. But if someone gave him our number and he called us, we could respond by either answering that call or letting it ring. And we don't pick up the phone, so to speak, to call God on our own. But he calls us. And as he calls us, he gives us the free will and the capability to either let that call go unanswered or to answer that call. We, we do not believe, uh, as uh, Calvinists do, that it is an irresistible call. We believe it can be resisted, just like the people in Jerusalem res resisted Jesus, even though he was calling them to himself. Uh, even though we're told that other people always resist the Holy Ghost. It is a resistible call. Um, and so we're called to open their eyes. We're called to let them know, hey, your phone's ringing. God's trying to get your attention. God is reaching out to you. He's speaking to you. And so we understand that our message is, as the same message was in Acts 3.19, to repent and turn back so that your sins may be blotted out. Or the message in Acts 17.30, uh, that the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. But we know many people resist that calling. And we know that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so God is inviting people everywhere to repent. He makes this invitation through His people, through His Word, and through His Spirit. And so, how do we open their eyes? Well, first, the Bible says that we need to help them turn from darkness to light. Turning from darkness to light. People, as I said, are born dead in sin. They are born in spiritual darkness. And what is Satan doing? He's seeking to keep them blinded to the truth. Keep them in darkness. What penetrates the darkness? Well, it's the light. It's the light of God. The light of God's Word. The light of the Holy Spirit. The light of God's truth. That's why Jesus refers to us as the light of the world. Because we pierce the darkness with the, the light of God that He's placed within us in the Word of God. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, or after the Beatitudes there in Matthew chapter 5, Ye are the light of the world, a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You see, your good works, they do not save you, but they point others to your Savior who's already saved you. Uh, and that's the way God's light shines through us. It's kind of like the way the moon reflects the sun, S-O-N. We as believers are to reflect the sun, S or excuse me, the moon reflects the sun, S-U-N. We as believers are to reflect the sun, S-O-N, Jesus the sun. And so our light is to shine before others, to open their eyes. But also, we want to encourage them to turn from the power of Satan to God. That's what he goes on to say in verse 18, from the power of Satan to God. And so as a result of being born into sin and born into darkness, we're also born with a depraved nature. We're born under the power of the evil one, the devil himself. And uh, a lot of people have this idea, you know, no, nobody's under the power of the devil except people like Charles Manson or Adolf Hitler or the worst of the worst that we can think of in our society. But can I tell you something? The devil doesn't care if he takes you to hell from a satanic Ritual or from a church pew. He doesn't care how he does it. He doesn't care if he takes you to hell uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, from, from the streets uh, of Sin City or from uh, the aisle of the local church. He doesn't care. All he cares about is keeping you blinded to the truth 
and keep you uh, uh, under his power, under his spell. And so he will, he will deceive you any way he possibly can, any method he possibly can to keep you blinded to the truth. And Jesus said, Paul, I want to use you to help turn people from the power of Satan so that they can come under the power of God. And the third aspect of that is receiving the forgiveness of sin. As a person comes to realize they're in spiritual darkness under the power of the devil, they also come to realize that they're sinners. And they sin and come short of God's glory. And, and because of that, there's this chasm between them and God that only uh, the Lord Jesus Christ can bridge. But in God and His great love and mercy offers people a way to be forgiven and be reconciled to their Creator. I love what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, 7, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Peter told the group there in Acts chapter 2 when he's preaching on the day of Pentecost in verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Or Ephesians 1, seven tells us that we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Or Hebrews 8.12 that God says, I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Or 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, part of the good news is the bad news. The bad news is really, really bad, but the good news is really, really good. The bad news separates us from God. The bad news tells us that we're condemned. The bad news tells us that we're on our way to a devil's hell. But the good news tells us that Jesus Christ has come to rescue us and save us from ourselves and from the penalty of our sin. The last thing that we do in helping people open their eyes is to let them know that they can have a place among those who are sanctified by faith, Jesus said in me. Apart from Christ and His forgiveness, we don't have a place in the kingdom. We're like those Jesus talked about who were without the wedding garment. However, when the light of Jesus shines into our hearts through His Word and through His people and through His Spirit, when these things release us from the grip of the devil and we repent of our sins and receive Jesus for forgiveness and we're given a place in God's kingdom, we're given a place among the sanctified. We are saints. Dear friend, there's no institution on this earth that can declare a person a saint. Only God can do that. And you're made a saint. You're made sanctified when you believe in Jesus. you are become a child of the King. So just as Paul was called for a purpose, you and I are also called for a purpose. We're called to be instruments in God's hands to help open people's eyes, to help them understand that they can be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the reign and rule of Satan to the reign and rule of Christ. God wants to use you, yes, you, individually and collectively as our local church and part of His church to fulfill His purpose to help us reach the city of Erie, Pennsylvania. Every believer has been called for a purpose. And let me remind us as dads and fathers and husbands today, we have also been given a very important purpose in God's kingdom. That is to be examples. That is to be servant leaders. That is to be spiritual leaders. That is to be godly examples to the next generation and, 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 and to lead our families in the ways of God. And I want to challenge you today if you're not where you need to be with God, if you're not the dad that you ought to be, if you're not the mom you ought to be, if you're not the son or the daughter or the, or the man or the woman or the teenager that you ought to be, let me encourage you, first of all, if you don't know Jesus, why don't you right now bow your head and bow your heart and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that I have sinned 
and I realize that you've been calling my phone and today I want to pick up an answer. I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to call on His name and I want to be saved. Will you do that right now? And if you've already done that but you're struggling in your calling, you're struggling in being the, the person, the Christian that you, got, you know God wants you to be, let me encourage you to just admit to God your need today, not because He doesn't know it, He does know it, but He wants you to humble, him, uh, humble yourself before Him. Because the Bible says when we humble ourselves, we will be exalted. But as long as we try to do it in our own strength and in our pride, dear friend, we will remain defeated. If we can help you, please don't hesitate to contact us and let us know. We're here for you. We'd love to help you any way that we can. God bless you, and again, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there.